about uh, software as medical device, uh, uh, 21 CFR Part 11 and its applicability in clinical research for drugs and device. Uh, um, our presenter is Banu Sharma. He holds a PhD in biochemistry uh, and uh, he obtained uh, his postdoc at Ohio University and Michigan State University. Then he went on to start his career in industry, developing commercial diagnostic tests for toxins, bacteria, viruses, stem cells, and large molecules. Um, he has uh, published five books and in the area of diagnostics, immunology, and uh, has targeted therapeutic systems. He holds uh, one patent and has published over 20 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He, he was a key opinion leader on 21 CFR Part 11 and, uh, uh, and, and when this regulation was in its infancy. So um, we are happy that we have invited him and uh, to speak with, for us uh, here at the SCCR. Um, GCP workshop. And thank you so much, Banu, for uh, your time and your expertise and for being here with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sujan, so much for such a nice introduction. And good morning, all of you. Uh, this talk is going to be about medical devices in general, but I will also go over clinical systems that we are used to, to use on a daily basis in uh, all over the place here at Stanford University. So the scope of this is much, much more than software as a medical device. Going to the agenda, there are seven chapters. I will go over all these and then finish up with FDA warning letters because they are important. And then I will be able to relate to part 11 that why we got these warning letters that were so many. So before I start, let's have document and record defined because that will be used consistently throughout this presentation. So dictionary defines it very well, but let's go to ISO 9001 definition. They used to define document and record prior to 2015, but then after that, with the advancement of technology and all those things, they revised the definition and they call it documented information, where it will go on a kind of medium and it will have some kind of information. So ISO definitions are, are, are important because many of them have been adopted by US FDA. So just to put everything in perspective, I asked one of my colleagues, John, to write a memo, which he did. He sits next cube to me. And then he said that, okay, uh, can you please go ahead with this memo and see uh, if, it, if everything is fine and please sign it. That is exactly what I did. And that everything was on the paper. I, you know, corrected few errors. And then after that, you know, I signed it. Then he took it. I handed it over him right away. Let's see that how I can put that into context because this is a paper document. So that takes us to poll number one that will clarify few things about this as well as electronic record. So Susan, please, poll one. Can everyone see it? Okay, I, um, if there, uh, yeah, we should see the answers coming in. Um, if everyone can see the poll, great. I see answers coming in. So if you could please answer the poll.
We will wait another few seconds. No more answers. I see we stopped uh, at 75%. So then I will end the poll um, and share the results. All right. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, the first one is obviously a paper record. That is uh, the correct answer. The second one, again, is a paper record, which is 60%. The third one is, is an electronic record in the sense that one has converted that into PDF, it is intact. And now it is being saved on the box drive. That is an authenticated drive uh, for us at the School of Medicine. Therefore, everything is intact there and that can qualify for a, 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 an electronic record as such. So let's proceed with the uh, presentation. There is a question, um, um, Banu. Uh, yeah. Do you want to answer the questions as we go or you want to save them for the uh, end? Uh, this is about question number one. Is desktop the physical desktop? or a saved file on your computer's desktop. Okay, so let me explain that. Now, uh, I believe you, John used the Microsoft Word to really create the document. We saved the Microsoft Word on the desktop and your desktop is really not safe because you, know, you can accidentally delete it. You will not know what happened to that or it may get deleted by itself because of many other things that could happen. Uh, someone can come to your cube and you are not aware of that. So many things can happen. In a nutshell, there is no control over the document that you have saved it as a word on your desktop. So that's the answer. Thank you. It, it's a good question. Should I continue with the next question as well? Is an image of a signed document an electronic record? like a PDF or a cell phone camera image of a signed paper document? Okay, I think all those questions will be under, answered later on, like the signed uh, you know, camera and all those things. There's a slide on that. Wonderful. So, I'll, okay, let's proceed uh, further. Uh, stop, okay. So results, uh, can you get out of the polls? Uh, okay, maybe I... Okay, all right. So going back to put everything in perspective that gets back to electronic record and electronic signature. So let us see what it is. If you look at the FDA definition, you can see it over here. Uh, generally it is very abstract, but if you want to put that in perspective, then like you create a, a document, like paper document, you know, it is created also like electronic means. You can modify it, you can maintain it. You can also archive it like file cabinet versus electronic archiving like box and the retrieve, this is very important. You can, you know, electronically you can retrieve it fast. Well, if you have a good filing system, it may take some time for you to retrieve if it is a paper record. And then the transmitted, I think this is very, very important because how would you transmit an electronic document, let us say over the cloud so that you know that it has not been compromised as opposed to a paper document that I handed over to John. So I will try to put all these things in context. Let's go to electronic signature. So this is what the FDA calls it. Symbols are series of symbols. And then also they define a few things that it should be unique to a person. It should be legally binding, equivalent to handwritten uh, signature. What they are saying that whatever the attribute 
paper has the electronic system should also have the same attribute electronic signature is also one form of digital signature so what does it mean the digital signature okay so in this case it is a kind of it is generated by some kind of rules which is the cryptographic method and then uh, there are some rules where one would have uh, a private key and a public key and that is controlled by a certification agency which could be independent of the person who is originating that it means it is being controlled very very um uh, cautiously uh, by the authority and some of you may have signed let us say mortgage application form by docu sign and it is a kind of electronic signature so that is one of the example you do not control originator is controlling as well as the certification authority is controlling to really make sure that whatever you uh, you sent you sent it to the intended person as well as when you send it back to the bank then you are the one who sent it and they received it there are electronic signature based on biometrics which is basically uses the physical feature of a person for example uh, brown eye black eye uh, blue eyes any kind of thing facial recognition uh, your thumbprint etc etc so basically uh, i had the opportunity to audit uh, quite a few data centers in the past and when i used to go to data center some of them used to have camera there that was linked when i sign it on the pin pad and they get connected to each other and then i will go ahead and audit the data center a uh, big data center so that is a biometric kind of signature that comes into picture and i think that was one of the question that was asked moving forward uh, i would like to take you through the history of part 11 it is very important and it's very interesting also therefore let's go back into this this was basically the part 11 came into being because of the request from many industry basically the pharmaceutical industry that were engaged in making pharmaceutical product basically manufacturing so um they wanted to know that if they can use electronic batch record or many of the things that are produced during a manufacturing process so fda listened of course they uh, published a uh, compliance uh, guideline uh, for that and they really created several guidance document at one time i went through all of them they were excellent uh, very very clear the fda really wanted intended to to see that the people start using and uh, creating electronic record so that we do not deal with lot of paper moving forward so what happened basically when the this became effective industry felt that they are not able to follow it. that was the main reason they did not understand what is part 11 what should i do because they had so many legacy system there were some new system and if all those system have to comply to part 11 by the letter of the law then it will become very very expensive so what they did that they ignored part 11 although they will use the computer system to create the batch record but they will print so instead of uh, getting rid of the paper they were producing more and more paper one of the example for this is the process analytical 
technology, which is a kind of innovative method for the manufacturing operations when a product is moving from point A to point B. So in this case, uh, if you have been in the manufacturing environment, traditional QA and QC has to be done. And then the product can move from one point to another point. So process analytical technology was introducing a introducing lot of uh, automated systems such as high performance liquid chromatography uh, in the line itself so that once the product comes from QC, it could be done autom automatically. For example, purity of a particular drug that could be done by SPLC. And if you get one peak, then it's, it's pure. So they complained that we are not able to follow the regulation and then uh, public is not happy. Again, the FDA listened to that. They said, okay, fine. If you are not able to adapt it, then we can do something about it. They came up with pharmaceutical GMP for the 21st century. They said it will be risk-based. They also said that since you are not, not able to really understand part 11, they will go ahead and revoke the compliance policy guide and then the five guidance document that we are done. But then here is a big thing. They also said that we are going to come up with another guidance document with a bold message that part 11 remains in effect. So that's the message uh, over there. And then they said that they will also re-examine the part 11, narrowly interpret and provide enforcement discretion. What does all these mean? Oh, enforcement discretion and narr narrowly interpret. I will come back to that later on because uh, that's the key to this uh, presentation. So that was about the events. Okay, so some of the guidance document in 2007 era was published about the computer systems used in clinical investigation. During the same time, I happened to be invited by Institute of Validation Technology to, to really interpret this clinical regulation with two other key opinion leader, Dr. Hoover and Dr. Will. So that's exactly, we did roughly half the workshop on that. And I think that things became really uh, clear because I used electronic patient diary for that. I do not know what is that background noise. Uh, so electronic patient diary to really go over all these points that are important. So this became basically the important point for many auditors that go and, and uh, audit the clinical trial systems where you are entering uh, the data directly, let us say uh, using a patient diary or remotely uh, retrieving the data or you know, important is whether you are doing the backup and recovery or not, change control pr procedure, training, et cetera, et cetera. So, the FDA also had one uh, draft guidance, 2017, that have uh, questions and answer that will be very useful for, for clinical research uh, personnel. Anyway, moving forward from 2017 to let's say in the future also 2025, there are a lot of talk about software as a medical device. So, so I just like trying to keep everybody updated and I'm not in a room. Uh, please mute uh, your uh, microphone. So Sorry, what is software? I muted everyone. Okay. So what is software as a medical device? They are stand alone system. They are not connected to any device because most of the people over here 
are used to a device that has hardware as well as software. But software as a medical device, they claim that, well, this is software and that is my medical device. I will come back to that later with some example. But then during the same time in 2013, an organization was formed, which is IMDRF. And, and the FDA is the chair for this, and WHO is the observer. It means that, you know, overall umbrella, they are under uh, WHO. And many countries all over the world are participating in this. And the function of IMDRF is to really set the direction for some of the things that are happening if we use software as a medical device. Now, these are all the things that are very, very important, but I will try to really make my point with the cyber security kind of thing, which uh, perhaps you may have heard that some of the devices have been hacked. And these are some of the systems that are medical device. Uh, forget about the software itself, uh, but that could be also uh, uh, here. Uh, so you can read it. Uh, let's go to a cardiac defibrillator and pacemaker. And uh, the pacemaker thing is very, very uh, important here because Medtronic was, was making the pacemaker and then Department of Homeland Security uh, issued a, an adv advisory notice on this that uh, this is likely to be hacked. And it has been hacked because they were updating the pacemaker using internet-based healthcare system update. So it was being updated automatically uh, if something, if there was a patch for the particular device. Now, if there is no control on this, then and if someone else is controlling or hacked it, person may die also. The repercussion for this or stake for this is very, very high. And then I do not want to go through all this because of the lack of time but I think you got my point. So, so let's take a poll on the historical perspective. So Sujan, please, uh, poll number two. Does everyone see the poll number two? If you could please answer the poll number two on your screen. We'll, we'll, make, we'll wait another minute or so. Maybe we can get more participation. Okay, I guess I will stop it there. Okay, and share the results. Uh, there we go. Okay, great. For the first one, I think most of the people got it right, 86%, uh, that's true. The second one is 
actually it is uh, difficult uh, to comply. How, however, uh, they will, the FDA will, will definitely give 483, no matter whether it is difficult or not. And the third one, yes, uh, this one uh, yeah, is, yeah, this is true. So most of the people got it right. So thank you. Uh, we can go ahead and proceed with the, uh, with the uh, remaining uh, presentation. All right. So going back to uh, the presentation, Let's see, let's get into the core of the Part 11 uh, regulation. Uh, this is going to be a little more difficult than what I have described so far, but I will try my best to see that how I can address all the areas in the regulation, uh, which is here on this uh, thing. The, the way the regulation is printed in the federal register, it is about four to five pages. So here I put everything, the main part here, uh, sub part A, that is basically about the scope and some definitions. B is about core of the part 11, about electronic record and electronic signature. And here there are 11 areas that are most important to the regulation. And I will go over all these later on. And then the part C is about general thing about the electronic signature. So moving forward. So let's get done with some of the definition that FDA uses. I will cite some examples, uh, you can read it. So a closed system is the one which is controlled by the person or the organization. So we are working here at Stanford University and the university controls the access to the computer system. Therefore, we work in a closed environment. An open system will be where we are working uh, you know, from home, it is still a closed system if we log on to a Stanford computer. But then if we use our own personal computer where other family members have access to that, there's no username password, then in that case, that is an open system. Or if you go to a library and you are checking your email, then that is also an open system. So that is the definition of closed and open system uh, in, a, in the simplest way to, to really understand it. Okay, now there are other areas like 11 areas that are core to part 11. The first one is validation. I will defer my discussion on this because this is very, very important, but then I will go over a few other things. Some terms that have been used, human readable, many people will get confused what it is. So when FDA comes on the site for inspection, and if the company declares that, well, we have the electronic records uh, for uh, our batch record or other kind of thing, then they would like to see that in electronic format that they can read it. They can also make a copy. And they can also request that, well, can you please um, show me the COPPA that was uh, created on this uh, three years ago? And then they should be able to pull out the record. So that's what it means, retrieval. Limiting access, everybody knows, username and password. Okay. Now, another thing that is very important is the audit trail. And this is the FDA definition for that. Again, I will simplify that. Audit trail is who did what and when. So who is the person, what it is, and then when it was done. Basically, it is date and time stamp. 
the FDA does not enforce that you explain why you did it. Okay, so other things related to RD trail uh, is about the, let's say, clinical system. You have electronic case report form where um, you are entering the value on the ECRF for uh, fasting glucose value. And then you notice that you made an error and you wanted to correct that to 100. Then it is very important that the old value that you corrected can be also seen clearly. That's what RD trail is. And the RD trail must be saved through the retention period of the record. Okay, I'll go over all these operational system check. Again, I'll provide example that in a manufacturing operations, you are creating bill of materials. That is one of the important thing. Then you put that in the electronic system, enter the data, and then route it for approval. So your bias record is ready to be executed. Another example is the SPLC that for the operational check that you turn on the instrument and the people who have worked on the SPLC in the lab, there are some things that the instrument check. It means that before even you can, you load your protein sample on the SPLC, it has to do certain sequential thing. That is called the internal check by the instrument. So it should be sequential. That is the operational check. The authority check, you already know, you give them password. And the device check, that also very important. I mentioned about that earlier that you are in a field and then you have some kind of device that is talking remotely to the server and you are entering the data with that device. Sometimes we can also call it terminal, you know. So, so these are the things that are important to understand of what the FDA said. Okay. Next one is about a uh, person developing a system. They should be trained and should have uh, education, which is the training thing, which all of you know. And then one must adhere to written policy and uh, procedure. And then the system documentation, like SOP, user manual, you should have all these things. And these are all part of part 11. Okay, let's talk about some of the terminology. Again, a document encryption. When you create a, a record and which is being sent for signature, in that case, the document is encrypted in the process. And many of you know who have used the Adobe sign. Now, the signature should be integral part of the document and that is called the record linking. A digital signature does a very good job of linking the signature to the document that you sign. And then signature manifestation is another term that part 11 uses, which means that when you sign a record, what it is for. For example, I review and approve the consent form, for example. So moving to the next one. Now, this is quite an irony that when you are dealing with electronic record, you must certify, it should be certified by the FDA or you should certify to FDA that you are going to use electronic record and electronic system. And it must be on a physical paper and then it has to be your own hand signature in ink and you should mail it. You are dealing with electronic record but you have to inform FDA by this process anyway. So there are basically some of the controls, username and password. Anybody, all of you are aware of that. And then password must be also changed periodically. And inversity forces that too. 
it is also important that some of the devices such as token and cards that are used to generate password they must be also maintained and safeguarded these are all important in part 11 let's take poll 3 sujan please can everyone see please uh, um let's uh, have some participation on this poll as well three questions on this poll as well Okay, I will go ahead and share the results. Okay, um, so I will go ahead and explain it. The first one uh, looks like most of the people got it wrong. Uh, this is very core to understanding uh, this uh, uh, presentation. When you are at Safeway um, and you just sign something, it is not controlled. and then they are just providing you a receipt and you just scribble something on a pin pad that is not an electronic signature because it doesn't have the component that will qualify for an electronic signature the one i discussed earlier that it should have manifestation username and password or many other things that 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 is around the control of the uh, signature being integral integral part of the document that it belongs to so second one most of the people got it right uh, 94% that's very good uh, the third one third one okay yes most of the people got it right library computer system is an open system we do not have, have control therefore we cannot use that to 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 sign a uh, gxp kind of document okay all right a move forward uh, okay i'll move fast uh, so that i can complete uh, the presentation and uh, this part is going to be uh, very important because it will tell the practical aspects of where part 11 apply okay so part where applies everywhere for the glp gmp and gcp systems that we are used to it also applies to quality system regulation at this time i would like to also mention about the gmp system from other country for example for example europe china asia japan and many other places if they want to sell their products in the united states in that case they must comply with part 11 however i'll give one example of the nx 11 which is very very similar to part 11 this is the european gmp chapter 4 in x 11 and if you read the nx 11 it reads really very very well much much better than 21 cfr part 11 and you will be able to understand it better this is the region i brought it up over here okay so 
some of the regulations that revolve around GMP, GLP, they are called predicate rules. They have been there for a long time. They are going to be there. So the BSH are demands that, well, electronic record and electronic signature will apply wherever the predicate rules apply. It means that you are working in a manufacturing operation. You are trying to create a manufacturing batch record electronically, sign it ele electronically. Part 11 is applied there because that is the predicate rule 21 CFR 211 for manufacturing. Okay, these are some of the examples uh, where it will apply a record ret retention period. Uh, when you enter something in the EDC, like source data verification, then a second person should also verify that. And then um, one thing that I would like to make it clear that if you are producing an electronic record, in that case, you must be very clear that what you want to rely on, whether you, you consider your paper as the original source or you want to rely on the electron. Uh, so this is very important. And that is what the FDA will look at. <clears throat> so, so wherever there is a predicate rule requirement, part 11 is applied. But then some of the areas, part 11, will not apply in terms of clinical arena or GMP. For example, financial record, like quarterly report that a, an organization may put out on the Wall Street because that is required. But then they also make it uh, compliant to part 11, and there is another law called Sarbain auxiliary law, where part 11 apply for, for those kind of things. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that, and FDA cannot cite us on that. Okay, next. Okay, let's take a poll over here. Sujan, please. Sure. This is a one question poll. We'll wait another few seconds. Any more participation? Okay, I'll end the poll and share the results. There we go. Okay, all right, 50%. Okay, all right. So the correct answer here is B, C, D, most people got it right. Some people said that A, that are, if you are 
you know, taking a paper record, putting in the fax machine and sending it to FDA, it is really not an electronic record. When FDA gets it, it is still a paper for them. So that is the explanation for that. So thank you all. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, great. So let's get into some of the examples of medical devices uh, and the computerized software systems. Okay, here are some of the devices. Um, and I have really chose some examples where I had the opportunity to work with. This is the variant medical system treatment planning system that is connected to a device Eclipse and True Beam. So this is the Eclipse True Beam, which is used to treat a cancer patient for many things, whether it is a kidney cancer, a breast cancer, lung cancer, anything, they will adjust the uh, wavelength of the radiation. If it is on the skin, then it will be, so be it, there is a software that really takes care of that that how deep the beam should enter. Now, the system connected to this, uh, there is a planning for uh, treatment planning system uh, for a particular patient because every patient will, will be different. So each patient should have a planning. So the, so the treatment software by itself is a medical device. Now let's go to software as a medical device. It is a standalone software. Again, I had the opportunity in 2018 uh, to work with Apple, AFib, and IRN application that is now approved by FDA for over-the-counter use. So many of you may be already aware with that, maybe wearing the Apple Watch also, it, it comes there. So that is one example, there are many more. Now software systems, we all know, RedCap, electronic health record system, a software to control pumping of the medication, these are software systems, they are not a device. Forward. Let's go with some of the system that we use over here. So RedCap, I think clinical research at least is very familiar with that. We, we use that uh, almost in, in many trials over here. Then there are Stride, I believe, site-based research uses it quite a bit, so are many other people. And yes, uh, Excel and Smartsheet, we use that almost on a daily basis. And then there are other database, uh, for example, Oracle Clinical, Medidata Ray, uh, Medrio, and all those things, these are the clinical systems. Anyway, so, now here is the core that how to make any computer system part 11 compliant. I think this is the core of uh, this talk. I'll try my best to summarize this, but then when you go and make uh, any system part 11 compliant, then one has to see that how complicated the system is. So Institute of uh, International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineer has done a very good job in classifying the software categories based on risk. So these are the categories with increasing risk level from one to five. So, Operating system, networking, and all those things, one doesn't have to worry about because they get qualified when we are trying to make our system qualified. 
the, there are firmwares. Uh, these are integrated uh, circuits, such as weight scale, uh, bathroom weight scale. There must be some kind of RAM there chip, or even the barcode scanner that you can scan uh, a label or anything that you want to, to scan. Then there are non configured products such as Excel file, Word, intravascular ultrasound that is used uh, to for, for the heart uh, to image uh, the lumen uh, diameter, and uh, HPLC. Many of you know that. These are all non configured system that you take it and use it. And then there are highly configured products such as clinical trial data management system, laboratory information management system, manufacturing information, manufacturing execution system. And most of the company use um, some kind of ERP system and many of them, mid to large company, they use SAP system that has many, many modules, uh, such as production module, financial module, very, very uh, well done. The fifth one is the software that we make ourselves. In our case, the IT may build some software in-house, and they are the riskiest one, because there are so many things that goes into building a software. So, so once we build a software, then one must keep a 20 as well as 13485. I mentioned 13485 standard because it lays out the things in a much better way that, than 820, although both of them are almost similar. Now, to get into uh, building a software, verification and validation comes into picture. Very, very important. And many companies, including Google, Facebook, uh, any company you name, verification is one of the most important thing that we do. And uh, some kind of automated testing is used to do verification if the development of a software is structured. However, for clinical system or any system that is used as a GXP, HP quality system has become the industry de facto. Uh, many of the industries are using automated selenium system for verification and testing, but then they have to follow some kind of methodology which jibes well with the FDA regulation also. So looking back to verification, let's define the term. And here is the important word, specific requirement. And then, then verification is basically, what is the input, what is the output? If you want a handle to move for a particular device, uh, let us say the couch that where patient is lying on a treatment device, then it has to be lifted up or down. And then you have some kind of input, what is output, you do that. Now, there are some other terms like white box testing. When you write the code and at code level, when you look at the code, then that is called white box testing. And then there are hardwares. And you have to be very, very careful to really write all the specification for the hardware. And not only that, you have to, you have to draw a design. For example, if you are designing a switch, then you have to have a very, very good diagram for that with various part and how the current will be flowing in that switch and how you make redundancy 
if it is a critical system where you don't want the switch to fail. Now the let's see what the validation. The only difference is intended use. It means who will be using the system? Well, people like you and me. So that is then the definition of validation. Simply put. So you can read this. And then I was mentioning about the testing. So when you do the validation testing, and in a GXP system, we do the black box testing. What it means that the code that has been written, we don't see it. We just we just test it manually to see that whether a particular things are happening or not. Basically, what we see with the eye uh, for a particular thing to happen. Now, there are some terms that FDA uses. When you look at the FDA guidance document, then they may use the term IQ, OQ, or PQ. So these are related to installation because as I mentioned, a device contains the hardware. How do you install all those hardware? This could be hundreds of pages of document that you know, may relate to that. And that's why verification and validation is so difficult to do that it requires a workforce to do the process. And that's why people don't get involved in that. Then there is operational qualification, where you test the functionality of the system. And then performance qualification more relates to when you have already made the product and you wanted to see, you know, in, you know from the user point of view, whether it is working or not. So after clearing this, some of these definitions, let's go back that how we really build the system and it, it leads to some of the technology, uh, some of the process that we use. One of the process is called waterfall, also the V methodology and FDA, likes the waterfall methodology very much. And that's what the pharmaceutical industry like Genentech, uh, Gilead, and many are compare, many companies are used to doing the waterfall methodology and the V model. So this is basically uh, the waterfall, which means that you cannot do the next step until you finish the user requirement, okay? So I will go over this in little more uh, detail. Uh, I think uh, we are to one hour at this time. So maybe I can wrap it in 15 minutes. So user requirement uh, is the most important document that's where you, you start with. The user requirement for complex system, such as SAP, may run into thousands of pages. You know, either you can do the automated testing where you code your requirement to the test, so that, and then I had been involved with that when I was testing the SAP system and creating the user requirement, and then the script is being generated to test the SAP system. But that is one of the, one of the examples. So then you go to functional specification where you translate the user requirement into function. Then you go and build the product. That is called integration testing, putting all the pieces together into one, uh, functional system that you have built. And then there are some other jargons that are used that once you have built or about to build, then you have to deal with factory acceptance testing or site acceptance testing. That also means that when you are delivering a big, uh, let us say, 
cancer treatment system, then the site has to be qualified for that. For example, one of the radiation devices may take a two football field worth of space for it to be installed. I am mentioning this so that you can understand the complication or complex complexity of some of the devices. Then you do the installation qualification. There are things which I will uh, describe a little bit in more de detail. Then the OQ, and then finally the performance qualification. For software as a medical device, there are new things that have come up into picture where you, you do different kind of user testing where patient itself will test, let us say you have five of them and then they are testing it. These are some of the new things that were not before. So I would like to mention that too. And then once you have deployed a system, then it, it is under change control. It is monitored. If you make any change, then you have to test the functionality again and see that the change that you made impacted any other functionality. And that is also one of the important thing to do. You will be surprised that I did not touch any other things. So how can they will be affected? But excuse me, they could be affected. So if you understand that, then this is the way we make a software system, no matter whether it is based on smart C or Excel file or yes, SAP system. <clears throat> Moving to the next slide. Uh, I didn't mention about the agile system. Nowadays, because the system, things are so complicated, people are using agile methodology, which means that they will build something which is barely functional. They will uh, release it and then repeat it until they think that, that it is working. And then they will start creating some of the documents just to really uh, squeeze the development time. <clears throat> So, so what is a uh, requirement? Okay, one of five, go there. I'm kind of being watchful on the time. So requirement, uh, let's start with the user requirement that I discussed and then um, go to uh, some of the important component. It should be very specific, you know, for example, if you are doing, uh, developing a clinical uh, system and you are trying to see that how age could be configured there, then you must be very clear it should be between 18 and 20, 80 years. Very, 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 very specific. Uh, it should be, one should be able to convert that into function. And then one should be able to test it. If you cannot test it, then it's no good. Uh, for example, um, you have to use the word shall because it is mandatory, not should. And here is an example. I have seen it many places. That's why I am citing that. Page should open with the performance of the system should be good. What does it mean? Can you test good? You cannot. Good for you is something else that good for me. So. You can translate, you, you can really write it like that. Uh, the web page should open within 10 seconds. I think I can test that. Okay. All right. Uh, then go to functional specification. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that the functional specification, one should be able to really convert the input into output and write the code for that. If you cannot write the code, and some common people like me and you may be writing uh, the functional specification. Then you use the pseudocode. These are not the actual pseudocode, but here is the pseudocode for 
a uh, one example if a less than 18 or greater than 18 exclude else include and then if you are really code savvy then you can write a code in let's say python or c++ programming or whatever you do and this is the actual code to calculate the age moving forward to the specification these are uh, when you design something and i mentioned about the switch you should be really very very uh, clear about the specification and here are some of the examples that you can read i think earlier i alluded to switch so i have already provided you the example for that and then there is something here is uh, piping and instrument diagram when you are installing an SPLC system, uh, this becomes very important that how you take care of many other ancillary things. Now, one of the system that I worked in the past is the laboratory information system. It took roughly one and a half year to deploy the whole system, it was a very complicated one. But then architectural diagram are very, very important when you design anything, because you will know that how it is connecting to the server, and there are many, and when you look at all the things, there are various layers in the software. What we see daily is only the user interface just the dip, dis, uh, display. What is happening in the background, we do not know. So this is the background, how the web server is feeding, feeding into application server, or uh, how the client is uh, communicating. Uh, client in this case is us like uh, user uh, that are doing the things on the computer. And then we generate a lot of report. Of course, that will go to some kind of database and then you can call the report. So there is a two-way communication, et cetera, et cetera. In a nutshell, what I'm saying that what you want is being fetched to you, but these are, this is some of the simplistic view to show you what is happening in the background. Now, going back to, to the way, if we do not have the sophistication of testing, a software by automated automated method like many other companies software companies pure software companies do then we have to write it in and still today some of the big companies um, you know bayer uh, roche pharmaceutical they still use this because yeah fda is used to look at this you know uh, so when you go to uh, write your test then you have to define the steps. For example, this could be some of the steps when you are clicking on an application and you are testing really everything. Click on application, log into system, click on demographic uh, where the age thing is. So here is the expected result. So when you click something, what, what do you think you will get? It? And it is already known what you get. It. So this is already written, you know, but here you leave it blank to see, uh, jot down your result over here that what it, what it is going to be. So in this case, the test case failed. It didn't pass because enter the age 150, the spe specification is greater than 18, less than 115, and then it failed. So this is very serious. And in software lingo or everywhere else, they call it bug. So this is a this is a bug in the system. At this time, you stop the run. You don't go further because you found a bug. Until the bug is resolved, you cannot proceed further. And basically, this will be fully documented and reviewed. And you have to log in the bug either in a system, let us say bugazilla 
or you can simply log in into you know some excel file where you keep track of that but then it is important that you resolve the bug before you redo the testing again so it means the moment you find a bug you have to really repeat it because one step is dependent on the other so basically to keep this in mind so this is one example that how to do operational uh, qualification this is the way you write when you go to do the iq basically you can modify that because you can define the uh, specification you can write your specification and then uh, what it is the expected result and you jot down what you see uh, so iq that way uh, is maybe less column but it could be more column also depending on how involved the iq you you iq each and then the pq the one that i described so in the end once everything is put together then you do the pq so we are uh, 903 okay we are i think uh, doing pretty good so so this is very important and this is the way we do the manual testing also called black box testing moving forward i think we come to another poll poll 5 so i request sujan to put it sure i'm launching it This is again a one question poll, similar format as the, the previous one. So, if you could participate, please. another couple of seconds uh, then i will uh, end the poll and share the results anybody else okay we'll end it there all right 91% for the and that is the correct answer wonderful uh, the, yeah so thank you very much i think all of you are following the the, the presentation uh, so i'll go ahead and uh, cover the few remaining slides okay now uh, this seminar will not be complete without showing you this why we are doing all this that's what you will see okay so please be aware that fda age giving 483 even until today as i speak on part 11 because i was referring to manufacturing processes and predicate rules under that rule they can site about drug labels manufacturing batch record so as you can see over here and i emphasize the validation but there are four areas that fda 
has cited 70% of the time, this makes 70%. In other fields such as data integrity, system documentation, SOP, Kappa, and all those things, about 30%. So in all these areas, there are citations, but data retention, validation, security, and audit trail, these becomes the target point for FPA. Let's look at some of the warning letters. So what is a warning letter? When the FPA comes on the site, and if they find something wrong, then they will write up 483. The 483 is equal to kappa that we give for non-conformance when we are doing the clinical trial. So that way it is easy to understand. And 483 becomes a warning letter when you are not able to respond to FDA on the 483 within 14 days. I believe that's the correct time, but I may be wrong. But I think one has to get back to FDA quite fast on that, that you are taking care of that and you have found solution, whatever it could be. So these are some of the citations that were given. And then let's look at number one. They directly cited part 11 over here. So you can know the importance of part 11. And they did it for electronic batch record. I'm not reading this, you can read it. If you have a question, I'm going back to the second one. They said system validation, audit trail, computer program, record data from each of the clinical sites, which is applicable to us also, not validated, audit trail. Now here, it is about the electronic signature when we FDA say that the signature should be trustworthy, reliable, and equivalent to paper record. Here is the citation. Then this is the citation for the installation qualification. Again, the validation. Next one. So these are some of the excerpts from the 483 that became warning letters. Some of them could be very, very recent also, but I will focus on this. Failure to allow FDA access to record. Now, someone there in the field or industry, they had their elect electronic record. FDA comes on the site, they want to be inspect, and then they could not provide the access to the record. I think that's very, very serious, you know. Of course, it became a warning letter. Electronic case report form, there was citation on that. Unauthorized data folder, like we are used to create the data folder here and there, but a control system had, you know, a structured data folder. This is about the change control, because when we use an EDC system, then we modify that during the process. And then many of you in the clinical research may have noticed that the change is taking place you know, on a continuous basis for the red cap cloud, for example, that is supposed to be part 11 compliant. But then you have to go through that, you know, through the change control process. Um, there are some more over here, failure to document changes, again, change control, Medical device company failed to validate computer software, you know, quite a few. So I will go ahead and now summarize my talk. Perhaps that may provide some, some time, maybe for some uh, questions, uh, maybe a few minutes. So in summary, I actually provided you a layman's a layperson's 
definitions for electronic record and electronic signature, went over the historical perspective that how it came into being, and then about that it is being still in force because we are getting 483 and warming letters. And then I devoted a good deal of time that how to really develop a, a or, or construct or build a device that is part 11 compliant. And then this summarizes the whole process from start to finish related to building a divan. In fact, there are quite a few things even before that, but because of the constrained time, I'll just, just go over this quickly. Uh, the summary requirement design and then impact assessment, which is related to risk assessment. And then we have risk assessment here with the clinical research uh, that I worked on um, to come up with, which is called STRACT, that we can use to do the risk assessment for the clinical trials that we are doing. Then we have to write validation master plan uh, before doing anything, and then start making the device, write the protocol, then do all the things that I mentioned, then release it, and then uh, use it. After that, maintain it. There will be quite a few release notes on that. Then it will be under control. What I did not discuss about the decommissioning. A device has a certain life, or a system has certain life period. And a time comes when you think that, oh, I just want to retire that. There are FDA regulations about that also, which is called decommissioning. So you have to, to really retire or decommission a system, but then you have to document that properly because it was used in the past, perhaps even keep that device for some time. So that one concludes my talk and I want to really thank all of you for putting up with me for almost one hour, 24 minutes, uh, which allows us to only five minutes or so. But if there are questions in the chat, I plan to answer that each of them and send it to you later on uh, so that all of your questions are answered. And now, uh, I'll open it to discussion, whatever the time we have left. So thank you again very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Banu. I uh, really appreciate it. This was very informative and very interactive with the polling questions, uh, very interesting questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if uh, we, we are at the time almost, but if you want to uh, look at them and answer the ones, uh, uh, for example, one of the question is about the, when you uh, talked about uh, what is software and what is a uh, medical device as software. And the question is um, that uh, uh, Feriel is saying she's confused the software system to control pumping of medicine. That sounds like, uh, like a Therac, um, which was a device, not a system. So if you could explain that. Uh, uh, Okay, so it is the way you use the system and that will dictate the classification. In this case, the pumping up medication is being used as an aid little bit to really get the medication to the, the patient and, and that's it, nothing else. Therefore, it is a software system that you are using it, but then it is really not the part of the medical device that may be inside the body or somewhere else, unless if you are delivering 
the medication through a patch. Let us say you, you have installed a patch under the skin and there are some circuit, uh, circuitry or, or flow there uh, and there small program that is pumping or that is really, let's say, putting the insulin. I'll give it an, an example. Insulin, when it is low, so the software, software saying, oh, insulin is low. Therefore, uh, let control it by uh, eating or it is time to take the medication, you know, and all those things. So that is a device. But externally, when you are pumping the medication for some other purpose, not even it is going to the patient, you are pumping it for some other reasons to make an aliquot that will go and fill a vial for later use. That's what I mean. It has to be part of something to call it a medical device. Otherwise, it is not. Hope it is clear. Now, again, people are confused with the software and a system. For example, Excel, Microsoft Excel is a software that we all use, okay? So that is a software. Is it a device? No, it is not a device. Uh, can it run um, on any device? Yes, because you can pull it from cloud, okay? But then it is not a device. Can you configure and make it part 11? Answer is yes. But then it will be very expensive. You can make it. I have done it. So those are the differences. When we say software system, that makes the hardware and software being together. But software as a medical device, it is stand alone software. You know, they say, well, it's not, it has nothing to do with device. You know, I'm claiming it as a, as a device by itself. That is the difference. For example, Apple AFib OTC device that runs on Apple Watch. If you have a watch, then you have that. If you want to use it, I do not know whether you have to buy it or not. I don't know that, but there may be some kind of fee involved with that. I, I do not know that part. But then uh, if you are using that, then if you have really episodes, then it will send the message to you. Hey, do you want to call a doctor? I think uh, you have some irregular heartbeat. And then in fact, you can press a button. You can call the doctor. Uh, automatically, someone will appear, and then if it is critical, they will evaluate that, and on the advice of the doctor, whether to go to emergency room or not, that virtual doctor may indicate. I mean, live doctor, but present virtually. So, hope the, the demarcation is clear. What is a software? What is a software system? what is software and a medical device. So thank you for asking this question because uh, it, it's, it's a very, very important question. Yeah, Fariel, thank you so much. Uh, you can please uh, feel free to unmute yourself because I see a couple of more uh, questions from you there and feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, I think uh, the, your questions were answered, but if it is not, please unmute yourself and ask. Um, I have one more question. It's, it says, is DocuSign Part 11 compliant? Oh, I see. Very good question. Very, very good question. Well, now, nobody can say for sure, even the systems that are Part 11 compliant, that it is Part 11 compliant. The reason that DocuSign sign has features for it to be part 11 compliant. So that is the due diligence one has to do. Bring the system, do the due diligence, install it properly, and then look at the features that it has. Uh, can you electronically sign it? 
and all those things. Once you can answer, say yes, then this part will comply. Okay. Another question is: Is the D, uh, STLC slide from six two three zero four? I don't know what that is. Six two three zero four. Oh, about uh, SPLC, where I mentioned the SPLC? SDLC slide, yes. Oh, SDLC slide, yeah. What about that? It, the question is, is that from 62304? Uh, I don't know what that is. Feriel, do you want to unmute yourself and um, ask the question? Uh, yes, okay. 62304 is the standard for medical device software. Uh, it's IEC not FDA or ISO. Um, and at the bottom of the document, there's a V diagram, which is standard for medical device software development. Uh, and it's usually your first interview question. <laughs> um, so, I'm, and it looks a little bit different from the STLC slide shown in this presentation. And I'm just wondering if there's another V diagram that I should go study and know the difference between 62304 and the source of uh, Dr. Sharma's uh, slide, or if it's the same thing, just interpreted a little differently. Okay, uh, Feriel, thank you very much for asking this question. Very, very important question. Basically, some of the things that I have presented, uh, these are taken from various uh, regulations, but in any particular uh, situation, STLC that you mentioned, it may differ. But the one that I presented, it is related, uh, the way the FDA thinks uh, are thought in the past, things are changing at a rapid rate. So it is not taken from any particular thing. Uh, these are generic kind of uh, waterfall model, because the waterfall model is when it goes down. And the V model, I have combined that with the waterfall to really, show the whole life cycle. So it is not, it will differ from, uh, from place to place, uh, uh, the way you interpret it. But I have tried to put everything into context of GXP system, which is GMP, GLP, GCP. I tried to, uh, to be within the real mass that how the FDA looks at it. That's it. Because there are software, you know, IEEE, since you mentioned about the uh, uh, STLC methodology, IEEE is involved, uh, uh, you know, quite a bit in really developing the software system and providing direction. So there are many, many organizations. Uh, and then again, it will depend on what what's your intent, what, you, how do you want to configure it? your choice ultimately of provided you know in our in our case it should comply with the with the us fda regulation so thank you for asking the question again Okay, so thank you everyone for being patient uh, and passing the hour. Um, if there are no other questions, we will end it here. Um, and uh, I will send out an evaluation. Um, I know most of the participants left, but I will email an evaluation. And if you would like to receive continuing education units, you will need to complete the evaluation with your full name on it so we can be, you know who were requested the continued education uh, and the issue certificates. So, um, thank you so much again, everyone. And thank you so much, Banu, for your presentation. Uh, I will stop the recording here and